The Bible embarrasses people. You should understand that as a fact of life, to the point that so-called modern-day scholars have undergone an intense rewriting campaign to remove many of the more embarrassing themes and subjects. You see, it's bad enough that the Bible talks about a virgin birth, and that embarrasses the sophisticated intellectual, but it also talks about creating an entire cosmos in one week. How embarrassing for today's learned and scientific brains to have to endure such preposterous, far-out fantasy in today's enlightened computer age. The humble man, however, is not embarrassed by the Bible as a whole, but is embarrassed by the revelation of his own sins. Normally, the humble man doesn't harbor a grudge against the Bible for exposing his wickedness, but instead he is usually willing to take responsibility for his actions and confesses his sins to God. This separates the humble Bible believer from the proud critic. This is why I'm quick to mention that I am a Bible believer and not just a Christian. Anybody can claim to be a Christian. The word Christian has become a joke. The term we should use from this point forward is Bible believer. That will separate the men from the boys. A Bible believer is someone humble enough to place their life under the authority of the Bible. The proud Christian, and I realize that's an odd thing to say doctrinally, the proud Christian does not necessarily place their life under biblical control because the Bible embarrasses them. The proud have an extreme grudge against the Bible. The Bible embarrasses them with miracles, which they cannot explain intelligently. Miracles don't seem to bother repentant and humbled people. I have a hard time being upset at any of the miracles. Here's a strange thought. Have you ever driven to a large body of water and gotten out of the car and walked along the shoreline only to see a person standing on the beach shaking their fist at the body of water and cursing it for existing? This is not an ordinary sight. Now I can understand someone being upset temporarily at a body of water if they've recently lost a loved one in a drowning accident. But a grudge against the Great Lakes, Hudson Bay, or White River is not something I hear too much about, but some folks have a grudge against the Red Sea. That pesky Red Sea crossing sure does get scrutinized, doesn't it? We've heard just about everything from, it didn't really happen, to, well, the sea only had a few inches of water in it at the time, to, well, maybe it was a nearby creek called the Reed Sea, and Moses made a typo or got confused. They've even had television shows trying to come up with scientific reasons to explain what they think really might have happened. They'll say it was a timely earthquake mixed with a drought that year, or a freak windstorm, or a combination of all three. I could probably come to the proud intellectual's rescue by proposing a theory myself. Let's see. Instead of a miracle, or the Bible being correct, what could possibly have happened here at the Red Sea Crossing? Hmm. Oh, I know what must have happened. Train beavers were sent in ahead of time by Joshua and Caleb, and they constructed a beaver dam, and that stopped the flow of water on both sides. What a hero I would become overnight. They toast me at parties and give me an honorary degree from an ivory tower of academia. I would probably be highlighted on Nova and the History Channel, and underneath my name they'd use the words expert in biblical archaeology, but without risking any further cheap shots that might offend the delicate and thin-skinned critics of the Bible. I don't really promise to behave, but I'll try. Here is a listing of what I believe embarrasses the so-called experts about the Bible. These will be highlights from my book, The Embarrassing Bible. Part 1, Lion-Like Men. Years ago, back when I was a teenager, I was reading a modern version of the Bible. I sure don't want to be guilty of naming names, as I'd hate to be thought of as a troublemaker, 
But that modern version, which shall remain nameless, was given to me, and I was encouraged by numerous people from all over Christendom to trust this version. And I did trust it, and I thought it was the entire Word of God. This was before my eyes were opened to certain topics of biblical preservation, and I remember being impressed with a man named Benaiah in 2 Samuel chapter 23. What impressed me was the fact that Benaiah went up to a tall Egyptian that was holding a spear and killed him with his own spear. To a teenage boy, this was very exciting, and I remember thinking, wouldn't this be a cool thing to talk about during our study time? Or better yet, hear a sermon on, but alas, your average Christian teacher wouldn't spend five seconds on this subject when you can learn and bore kids with nativity scenes and discussions on tithing, Greek words, and the opening monologue from Tertullus the lawyer. Ben Aiah was pretty cool in killing the Egyptian with his own spear, and he killed a few other dudes as well, but the highlight was the tall Egyptian. Or so I thought. Years later, after my eyes were opened, I read those same verses with my King James Bible and noticed that Ben Aiah also killed two lion like men. Boy, was I shocked! I can't believe I missed that. How could I have missed that? I missed it because it was taken away from me. That verse embarrassed some of the more sensitive crowd, the kind that has lace on their undergarments. Notice that the version on the right, which I was urged to use by my leaders of the former church during my youth, it did not give me a key detail. Somebody thought such a detail was a bit far-fetched, and since they the modern scholars, didn't understand it, then it must not be very important. They were embarrassed by the text, and because the Hebrew word they tripped on was Ariel, do you see the E-L, the L ending on the word? The E-L is from Elohim, which can be translated as God, or God's plural, or angels, or something a bit more than a basic human. So you have men that are lion-like. It suggests that these two men were supernaturally strong, as if the men were part lion or totally dedicated to lions as to make themselves as lion-like as possible. And the Bible is very clear to make a distinguishing difference between these two lion-like men and a common ordinary lion. The Bible does that so that you know he didn't just go kill three lions. The modern scholar looks at that word Ariel, and he knows that it's part lion and part of something more than a natural man and extraordinary, but the scholar can't understand the text. And more importantly, he refuses to believe the text. So they begin to water down the interpretation and say, it must be talking about strong warriors. Or as the version I read as a teenager put it, Moab's best men. Anything but believe the text as it stands and where it stands. They'll say that the text should be translated as anything from them being fierce warriors to even sons of Ariel, making the word to be a proper name of some fella named Ariel. But the text doesn't call for sons of somebody named Ariel. And quite frankly, when I hear the word Ariel used as a name, I tend to think of this. The modern scholar can't believe his eyes. Why, it seems like some crazy story straight out of science fiction. You do realize that the Christian that gets embarrassed by any of this will have a hard time at any social gatherings as he fears someone might poke fun at him for going along with such a crazy idea. They'd rather rub shoulders and socialize with the so-called high society than to hang out with us Bible believers. After all, the subject of witnessing might pop up, and they couldn't handle that. Better to stay with the crowd more interested in their golf swing. This is embarrassing to the so-called intellectual. And right about now, you yourself are starting to have some of your own doubts and mental reservations about it as well. So, who were these dudes, and was this a mistake in our old Bible? Before resorting to the standard operating procedure of the embarrassed Bible critic of when in danger or in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout, let's try and remain calm 
What if I showed you two gentlemen that had a rare disease that made them look like lions? Would you be open to scientific proof? Here is an actual photograph of a man taken in the last century who had a disease called hypertrichosis. The main thing to remember is don't doubt the Bible and don't be embarrassed. This man's name was Stephen Bybrowski, who lived from 1891 to 1932 and was better known as Lionel, the lion-faced man. He managed to get a job as a sideshow performer as his whole body was covered with long hair that gave him the appearance of a lion. Speaking of being embarrassed, Lionel's mother was embarrassed by her son, and she gave him away to a man that toured Europe displaying the young boy on stage. Lionel eventually ended up in the United States and appeared with Barnum and Bailey Circus. He would perform gymnastic tricks and would speak to the audience, showing people that he was intelligent. Here is a postcard of Lionel in Europe. He could speak five languages and was usually dressed in fine clothing to appear as a gentleman. He later moved to Germany and died in 1932. He was 41 years old. Wouldn't this man be described as lion-like? I'm not saying the two men from Moab had this skin condition, but here you have scientific evidence of a man being lion-like. So, why get nervous about a verse in my old Bible? The other gentleman I wish to show you is named Petrus Gonzalez. Petrus was born in the Canary Islands and was taken shortly after birth to France, where he was considered a medical marvel. In the year 1573, he married a French woman and produced a boy and a girl who had similar conditions. In 1582, their portraits were painted in Munich. He died in 1618. Now, I've just given you two modern-era examples of people that would be a sensation in Hollywood. The physical evidence of both of these men is available for anyone to research and find for themselves. Yet, for some reason, when the Bible says that a Jew, who was loyal to King David, went and killed two lion-like men from Moab, the text is rejected and watered down. Now, why do you suppose that is? Scholars have an odd tendency to distrust things they can't imagine or things they didn't dream up or invent. Not only does ben kill two lion-like men, he then goes down into a pit and kills a lion. We are given a bonus detail in the fact that this happened during a time when it had been snowing. The Bible is loaded with details such as this. That's why when certain details are removed... In the modern translations, we all suffer from a void. The spiffy new NIV 2011, recommended by numerous preachers, organizations, denominations, bookstore peddlers, and Roman Catholic Cardinal Carlo Martini, who assisted in creating what led to Nestle's Greek text, which led to the NIV, has changed their translation to say that these two men were Moab's mightiest warriors. This is a slight improvement over their 1984 edition, which said, Best Men. One time, I was in a wedding as a best man, but I hate to cloud the issue here any further than the fine folks at Zondervan are noted for. Somebody got embarrassed, and when they read Lionlike, they blushed and thought of this. But, of course, this shouldn't surprise us. Men have often thought of fairy tales when they choose to not believe the Bible. I have just given you a scientific and rational explanation of what the lion-like men could have been. So there never was any need to doubt the text in the first place. However, not everything needs a rational explanation. I couldn't begin to explain everything in the Bible because some faith is required. But, since you didn't ask, I'll tell you what I think the lion-like men were up to. I think the Moabites were worshippers of false gods. I think they, along with many other heathen cultures, were fascinated with the idol worship of creatures that were mixed with human features like the Sphinx. There were numerous idols like the Sphinx, and they continued to show up. I think those Moabites had caught themselves a lion, and they kept it in a pit. I also think they probably wanted to take on many of the attributes of the lion right on down to looking like one if they could. 
when they fought, they probably tried to be as fierce as they could be. They probably tried to grow and cut their hair in such a fashion that they looked like lions and fought like them as well. It wouldn't surprise me if they went around acting and behaving like lions while tripping on some ancient drugs that had had them roaring like maniacs. I bet if you saw one of them running over to you, you'd make yourself scarce. I also wouldn't put it past them to be possessed with evil spirits. They may have even engaged in all kinds of perverted acts, of which I won't talk about here. Don't put it past a culture to experiment genetically on themselves, trying to become the master race. It's as if modern scholars had never heard the term catfight. Why, all you have to do is go to the downtown bar and see smiling grown men open a fresh beer as they chant catfight when two women start clawing, scratching, biting, and killing each other over just about anything, and it's usually a man. There are whole groups of people on the internet that enjoy trying to make themselves look like tigers and lions. This shouldn't surprise us, and your average Bible believer isn't surprised too often by the strange behavior of mankind. I don't pretend to know just exactly what it was about these two men that made them lion-like, but at some point you need to confess that this world is a whole lot bigger and has secrets about things you haven't even dreamed of. Today we are adding jellyfish DNA into all kinds of animals, and that's just the bare minimum that they're even telling us about. If it says he killed two lion-like men, then he killed two lion-like men, and then went down into a pit and killed a lion. And he took the spear out of the hand of a large Egyptian and killed him with it, just like it says. You can't tell me that there was never anybody on earth that would have been confused about lion-like features, because I just showed them to you. ben gets robbed of part of his valiant deeds in many newer translations. The Moabites that he killed were not your ordinary run-of-the-mill fellows. ben is the type of guy you don't want to mess with. If he owed you money, I'd probably lead off with a couple of jokes before I'd remind him about it. And some modern textual critics should be very glad that ben isn't allowed to come down to earth and hunt them down. Mankind's fascination with animals and becoming animal-like is not limited to a time period of 3,000 years ago. Here recently, a woman in Europe has been trying to become in tune with horses. Now, this was a combination performance art and experiment of receiving horse blood that had been treated, then placed in her body. The controlled blood was removed later, and this woman said she had a sense of strength and at the same time extreme nervousness. The alleged artistic part of this performance was where the woman walked around on special horse legs. Who's to say some ancient Moabite high society art lovers said, hey, let's start messing around with lions and then mix it with our religious ceremonies. And after a few generations, they end up with any number of possibilities. In the Bible, we were told not to drink blood. We were told that numerous times, so throw that into the mix as well, and who knows? You'll end up with some strange behaving people at the very least. You don't end up with ordinary men. Chapter 2. Adultery. Tucked away in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, is a small list of fleshly sins that can arise. Paul was very clear and led off with the chief fleshly work of the flesh, adultery. And yet, as the years went by, one scribe working on his copy of the book of Galatians seems to have been embarrassed by that word. Could it be that this later scribe was stepping out on his wife and coming face to face with this written conviction? So the scribe moves past the word and reaches for the scissors and cuts it from the text. One can almost hear him think as he says to himself, Ah, now it reads much clearer. Or, Finally, I can understand the word of God as this new manuscript speaks to me in clear, concise beauty. My Bible listed four things, but you'll notice that now only three things remain. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison. My Bible is on the left, and it lists four things. One of them is adultery. And yet this modern version on the right, recommended by numerous TV evangelists, only lists three things, and adultery has been removed. And I'm not just picking on the Good News Bible. It also has been yanked out of the Revised Standard Version, 
and the NIV. The New American Standard and the New Living Translation, the ESV and the Amplified, the Southern Baptist Holman Christian Standard, and their good friend, the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible. What strange bedfellows! Could it be that this embarrassing subject of adultery is so bothersome to a modern scholar's mindset that when confronted with the subject again in James 4.4, 4, that this time the phrase adulterers and adulteresses is too large to erase entirely due to the void it leaves in the verse as to who is being addressed. But if the scholar is crafty enough, he can squeak by if the finger is pointed at the female. What a sneaky thing to do, right, ladies? Here on the right, this Phillips translation only mentions the ladies as being adulterous. Boy, it's a good thing that modern scholar Brother Phillips was able to help us men out. Only the women folk have to worry about that verse. We can approach our wives and let them know. Now here, honey, here's a wonderful translation for you. You just keep reading Brother Phillips' monumental effort in making things clearer for modern man while I head off to the office for a while. And, oh, by the way, I'll be a little late for dinner tonight as I uh, I have to run a few errands for the boss's secretary, so don't wait up for me. Those lovely Christian brethren are like the same chaps who insist on throwing the women caught in adultery towards the feet of Jesus, but can't seem to find the adulterer. Sort of like Dr. Daniel Wallace, who teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary. Wallace can't seem to bring himself to call the account of the woman caught in adultery as scripture. Men will go out of their way to think thoughts that are contrary to the Bible. Isn't this all a bit too convenient? How embarrassing it is for these men, and the term men is used here in the technical sense, <clears throat> the men who must distance themselves from my Bible. In case you're worried that I'm being too harsh on these men, I'll clarify by saying that I'm quite sure these men are snappy dressers and can carry a tune. The same manly scholarship we saw in chapter 2 will show up again when it comes to taking care of widows here in chapter 3. My, how certain physical chores seem to bother the scholarly man who spends his life seated in the upper rooms of ivory-covered buildings. Modern man has seen fit to change 1 Timothy 5.16. Men are relieved of that pesky burden of taking care of widows. Those Greek scholars that want you to follow a few corrupt Greek manuscripts that were altered by some Greek-speaking agnostics, who secretly thought all women were slaves, would have men elevated above this sort of woman's work. Well, there you go. The man has been erased from the duty of taking care of widow relatives, and now only the Christian woman has to do that exhausting work. Thanks to the caring and sensitive ESV, and you dear sweet sisters were so thrilled when these gender-inclusive Bibles started hitting the shelves, you were so excited to see terms like brothers and sisters replace the word brethren. It warmed your pink, beating heart to see a Bible that didn't seem so masculine. Thanks to the newer and celebrated Bibles that help liberate you from archaic and unpolitically correct terminology, you just got abandoned and left to handle things all by yourself. So get busy and take care of them widows while the modern man discusses important matters like a better rendering and giving people a clearer, more modern understanding of the Holy Scriptures.